I forgot to uh, mention that something else that's in the Irish Medicines Board remit, which is quite a large area, and that's veterinary products. So not, I, whenever I think of medicinal products, I always think of human medicines. But they're also in charge of regulating all the hundreds and thousands of, of drugs that are used for veterinary care. So they have vets who work for them, and they have a veterinary inspector who goes around um, not only to check the manufacturers of veterinary products, but also clinical trials that are performed in animals before the veterinary products go to market. So that's another area. They go out to farms and uh, to all these places where um, the products have been tested on um, animals, but they're products for animals that are being tested on animals. So um, that's another part of their remit. The other thing is um, a new law has actually come into force regarding cosmetics in France, and they're not generally very proactive as regards animal welfare or <laughs> anything like that, but this will be part of the EU directive that has to come into law in 2013, and that is that on all cosmetic packaging, they have to list the carbon footprint. <coughs> in other words, what the footprint that was made during the actual um, making of the package and also as regards is the package recyclable and what sort of footprint I think it's going to be a category A, B or C and they'll explain on the packaging so uh, the marketers will be under fierce pressure to make sure that the packaging is all recyclable and that hasn't um, made too large a carbon footprint in the production of the packaging. There's no such regulation as regards medicinal products at the moment but I think that's to do with the size. Cosmetics are much more bulky than you know, drugs, blister packs, or little bottles of tablets, so. Can you give us a bit of an idea of what you screen for when you're screening individuals who come in for human oh. uh, When we do healthy volunteer studies um, at Chandon Clinic, our uh, quorum or, or our, the, 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 the population that we select our health, healthy volunteers from generally are students uh, from the universities in Cork. Now, uh, it's quite stringent. We can't use any students who our medical director has lectured to, um, because our medical director is also a lecturer in the medical department at uh, UCC, because there might be, well, you know, if they're in his t tutorial group, for example, uh, you know, there's, there's a chance that perhaps they'll feel obliged to do a clinical trial. So that's one of the first um, criteria. Second of, uh, criteria is the Irish Medicines Board only allows you to use a volunteer <clears throat> every 12 weeks, which is about three or four times a year. Now, the amount of blood that is generally taken from a healthy volunteer is much less than a blood donation to the blood bank. So um, it's, it's more, put it this way, it's more stringent than somebody who can donate blood, which I think is every, is it 60 days or 30? I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not a blood donor. Um, but anyway, so those are the two big regulations. What we do then is we'll advertise normally uh, through the university um, websites and we have a lot of repeat volunteers. We have a database and we'll send them out a text or that there's a study coming up. They then come into the clinic. Um, if they're a new volunteer, they have a series of questions. We can't use asthmatics, we can't use anybody who um, is on any long-term medication. We can't use anybody who's had antibiotics in the last <coughs> 28 days. We can't use anyone who's allergic to penicillin. We can't use anyone underweight or overweight. Um, so those are the, the initial criteria we ask them. We can't use anyone who uses any recreational drugs. Now we have to specify that cannabis comes up in the urine screen for about six to 10 weeks after it was smoked or ingested so we have to stress that because they generally will plum ask you that they don't and then they'll say it was passive smoking <laughs> but <laughs> so we uh, so once they've answered all the questions we then um, they then go and see the medical investigator and he takes what is called informed consent and that means he goes through the particular clinical trial step by step tells them what will be involved tells them about the medication they'll be taking and if they are happy with everything, they sign what's called an informed consent form. This is witnessed and the investigator also signs it. They have to be over 18. Uh, English has to be their primary language. Um, 
and those are the criteria to take informed consent. The informed consent form has to be approved by the Ethics Committee and by the Irish Medicines Board. There are certain things that have to be covered in the informed consent form. What we do with their data, that we only use initials and dates of birth for any results that are sent outside of the country, that it's anonymized, um, exactly what we'll be screening for when we perform the medical screening. Um, because one of the things we screen for is hepatitis C and HIV. This is for their own protection and for our medical staff's protection because we will be taking blood samples from them. Um, so there's a, it's quite a long document that they have to read and that's discussed with the doctor. That's about a 10 page document. They then sign that. Initially there was what was called a washout period but the Irish Medicines Board have now got rid of that for healthy volunteer studies. The washout period was um, a week where they went away to think about it and then if they were still interested in doing the study, they'd come back. Now they can actually go straight away and have a medical screening. The medical screening is height, weight, blood pressure, a full blood screen. A lot of young girls who aren't eating well will fail. They'll be anemic. They'll have um, low, you know, low uh, red cells, so low hemoglobin. They'll be anemic, so they'd fail on that. Uh, also, university students don't eat well in the, you know, in the mean. So uh, a lot of them might fail on some of those parameters. Um, I did my master's degree on um, studies in healthy volunteers, and, and the common things were anemia, um, drug, uh, cannabis, uh, urine screening. They failed on cannabis. In Ireland, they, they very rarely fail on cocaine or benzodiazepines. Maybe it's because they just give the clinic a wide berth, but in our clinic in Manchester, you would have a lot more people failing on hard drugs. Um, either they thought they'd get away with it or they, they didn't realize that it would come up in their um, urine screening. So, But cannabis is, is, is very prevalent in Ireland. Uh, over the years, it's getting more and more prevalent. Maybe it's getting cheaper, I don't know. But um, So we screen for that. Um, uh, we also do a, a biochemistry screen um, and then every study is different. Some studies, if they're looking for a particular thing, they might have an additional, additional um, uh, blood samples taken. All those are sent away to um, a laboratory in the UK who send back all the results and if they pass all of that and the rest of their medical is fine, then they um, can do a study um, at the clinic. And study is generally... Um, one, dr one drug being compared to another, which means they have to come into the clinic twice. Um, this is for an equivalence, what's called an equivalence study. And if, for example, you're testing ibuprofen, the only way you're gonna show that it's equivalent is to show that it's absorbed exactly the same. Um, so what happens is they come in, they stay in the clinic overnight because they have to be fasted and we have to make sure they're not drinking alcohol. They're also alcohol tested as well. Then in the morning, they're given the tablet and a little cannula is put into their arm. Uh, like a drip, um, it gets put in with a needle and the needle gets taken out and the little piece of plastic is left in the vein so that they can move their arm for the day. And we have a little tap at the end. And then they're given the tablet to take with water. And during the day, samples are taken, tiny, tiny little samples into vacutainer tubes. And those are all sent away and they're analyzed for the level of say ibuprofen in the blood and the results are compared between the two and if they they can are, are superimposable or the two drugs have the same absorption then they are co considered equivalent and that data is sent to the Irish Medicines Board and together with any side effect data and then that new version of ibuprofen can go onto the market. Um, they get paid, they are only allowed to be paid for their time and inconvenience not for the risk associated with. Now, unethical companies in the UK or elsewhere might, oh, we're paying you 2,000 euros to come into the clinic for two days. When you see that, you would be a bit suspicious um, they, that they must be paying. You can only really pay for a, a loss of one day's pay or close enough. We pay 150 euros a day um, uh, so that the average price is 300 euros for the two days in the clinic and then they get paid for follow-ups and you know some studies they might have to come back for a 24-hour blood sample and maybe a 36 hour so they add up so you know you have students coming in saying do you have a big one coming up they mean <laughs> up to Christmas they mean you know a bigger study so um, you know that's that's what uh, that's what healthy you know healthy volunteer studies and you know in, um, that's what's involved 
No, we don't do ch uh, child studies. You ha it's have to. It's becoming more. And if the drug is intended eventually for a pediatric market, studies have to be done in children, um, and those are well, they aren't done by Shannon Clinic. Although we did do, we've done a lot of outpatient cosmetic studies on babies. We did a nappy rash study, which was great fun, and 200 babies. And uh, obviously, then you get consent from the parent, not from the child. We did a big um, headlight study which was on school children, uh, 2,000, and we thought we'd have trouble recruiting, but you don't. Once there's a lice outbreak in the schools, it's, you know, and they don't discriminate between clean heads and dirty heads. People think it's, you know, but if your children are in school and there's a lice outbreak, and um, it's funny, and on all the studies we've had on head lice, what, what showed that works the best, it's all to do with the combing. It's not the product, what you know. I, I don't think we, well, we didn't, we didn't look, that wasn't the, one of the parameters we looked at whether or not you'd have color or not, but um, what happens generally is parents will wash the children initially with the product. There are a lot of, you know, head lice products on the market, but they wouldn't get the tiny nits out, and then a week later, they'd all hatch, and then their hair would be teeming, so it's very important to have the nit comb, so all our nurses were all covered up in you know, astronaut suits and shower caps and we had to comb their hair onto black pieces of paper so we could actually see and we literally with nano, nano scales we had to weigh you know, the number of nits left in the, yeah, but you know, th those products have to be tested so um, that was actually a tablet versus a, 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 a lice shampoo, both the same drug but one was in tablet form and one, you know, because and the tablet worked very well, the, the, the lice tended to drop off. So we have had children in the clinic, but we, we haven't done drug studies per se. We've done, we did um, a, a psoriasis study on babies as well um, a while back, but you know, we had to get the parents', parents um, uh, approval for that and the Irish Medicines Board approval. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, any, any generic that is going to go on the market, even if it's an established ingredient, you know, exactly the same. Doesn't matter because there might be something in the excipients or in the formulation or in the capsule that's slightly different that has, a, has an effect. So you have to do these equivalent studies to show that your copy or your generic is exactly the same as the one that's currently on the market. Um, unfortunately, what happens is, um, as the regulations are becoming more and more tight and more and more difficult, in the old days, old days, products would get onto the market that actually weren't very good, and now we have clients coming to us with a product that's much better, and it's super absorbed. In other words, it's absorbed much better. So even if your, your drug is absorbed 100%, if the one on the market is only absorbed 80%, your drug fails. So. It's really frustrating because there are a lot of drugs that are currently on the market. There will never be any copies. There'll never be any, any cheaper versions. A typical example is low sick, a meprazole for heartburn. It's very expensive. If any of you have used it, you would notice that. It's because there are very few copies on the market because it's almost impossible to, to show that your drug is equivalent because the ones that are on the market aren't necessarily that good. And the ones that are being formulated in the lab because the conditions are so stringent now are better, so they're not equivalent. So you can be better, but you'll still fail. You know, you have to you have to be exactly the same as the one that's on the market. When you're test testing products for veterinary use, are they tested on? Well, yeah, yes, they would be. Yeah. No, we don't do that. I, I've never actually been involved in that. I've only sort of seen it on films and things. I, I'm not sure if there are even any companies who do that in Ireland. I, I presume there might be. Well, in Ireland, as regards clinical trials, they've what are called field studies that are done in hospitals and it in family doctor, you know, GP practices. So I presume on some of the farms there <coughs> might be some field veterinary clinical trials going on. Um, I don't know to what degree they, you know, a lot of it might be pre-done in the lab. I, I haven't, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I met somebody who used to work in good veterinary practice who now works in clinical practice and she used to go around and it would be, it would be exactly the same, you know, all about the safety and well-being of the animals versus humans and it's, it's very highly regulated. But I would say that they would probably have to, what they call sacrifice, but they'd have to kill some of the animals at the end because they, they'd have to raise the dose to a toxic level to see, you know, to find the right, I, I don't know, I, I'm very, I'm not really. How do they thought that we're not testing animals, you know, it's very... Yeah, well, the, 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 
well, they're not tested on animals. Even with clinical trials, they, they, def, they, they are, t medicines are still tested on animals and they always will be. Everything I was talking about earlier referred to cosmetics. Yeah, no, I mean, medicinal products have to be tested on animals. Um, there are, a, it's different by country to country as to what animals are used. Uh, typically for um, the uh, reproductive toxicity, um, in other words, if a female is pregnant and she has taken this drug, um, they use rabbits. Um, rabbits are most similar as regards the teratic, uh, teratogenic effects, that's the effect on the fetus, to human females. So they do a toxicity on the fetus, they do it in rabbits and on, in white rats. Um, as regards dose escalation studies, which is to see, uh, you know, find the right dose, they do that in beagle dogs. I don't even want to go there. I, I've never been involved, in, but it ha I suppose it has to be done. Um, until they find some synthetic way of, you know, eventually I'm sure it'll be done robotically or done in the lab, but they use, they use dogs. I don't know if they still use cats, maybe in France, they still, yeah. I'm very down on the French, but they do. <laughs> yeah, they, they used to use monkeys a lot, which is, um, uh, you know, the famous picture of monkeys smoking and things. I don't know uh, in, as regards, um, because I'm not working in, you know, in, I'm not working preclinical, I'm only working clinical, which is, all in, in man. Do you know there's a lot of products coming out now that are going to be parabens free? Yeah. But what, what is the problem with parabens? I think it's related uh, supposedly to an increased risk of certain cancers. There was a, a kind of a, a bit of a scare about certain deodorants. Was it related to a deodorant or an antiperspirant, I think? Yeah. I think it's to do with. Um, uh, there was maybe an, a slightly increased incidence of certain cancers related to parabens. Now, um, unless I work directly with that, I wouldn't, you know, it's such a, it's such a big field, but I think it's to do with cancer. Um, it, a lot of cleaning products I know have been um, related to increased risk of developing cancers, but you'd never leave the home if, you <laughs> if there's so many things out there that are an increased risk. People forget that that's all relative. You know, the original risk might be 0.005% and an increased risk might go up to 0.007. You know, so it's, it, everything's relative. I mean, there are certain things that are related to breast cancer. Risks increased, <laughs> the, the biggest being if you're a BRCA1 car carrier, you know, of the breast cancer gene. But there are certain things, a high fat diet and um, stress, and those have been proven, but uh, you know, there's only so, so many things we can do to reduce our risk factors. Um. Could we be totally tested on animals? Because you said that you, they can't be the safety is not as well tested for medicine. Yeah, we, I think with cosmetics, it's because uh, there's so many active ingredients that are known that they don't need to test them anymore. Um, that's what they oh, right. feel. It's different with a medicine. There's so many, what's called, you know, new drugs coming onto the market. I think with cosmetics, they feel that the market is fairly saturated. And I mean, currently you can put any cosmetic on the market, but the contents isn't controlled. It's the labeling, as I said, that's controlled. So I think it's to do with the fact that they feel cosmetics. Yeah, and they feel it should be t tested directly onto humans because it's, 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 it's not being ingested. And if you look at the risk benefit ratio, it's much smaller, so. Yeah. If, if a cosmetic is absorbed beyond the skin, then it, is, it will be considered, that's something else. Um, uh, what makes a cosmetic not a cosmetic? There are five different things. One is if it, if it changes your metabolism, that's a very wishy-washy, um, that's a case-by-case -case basis the Irish Medicines Board would assess. If it changes your metabolism, if it's absorbed beyond the skin, for example, if you rub something into your knee and it's actually supposed to have an effect on your knee joint, that's not a cosmetic, even though it's been applied to the skin, because its um, point of, of, of efficacy is deeper than the skin. Um, if you present something as having a medicinal property, even if it doesn't, it's no longer cosmetic. So that's why I said it's about label claims. So um, uh, those are the, I think there's one other thing that what makes a cosmetic not a cosmetic. I'll just. Um, so a lot of them wouldn't be cosmetics. They'd be, you know, null and null and void, as cosmetics, um, and they wouldn't. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, a cos cosmetic is only used, number one, to hide something, uh, like foundation. Number two, to um, protect something, like uh, sunscreen. Number three, to keep something in good condition, to perfume something, like a deodorant, and to correct body odors. So um, those are the only properties that a cosmetic should have. Um, otherwise, it's something else. <laughs> Uh, pharmaceutical or uh, um, functional food or uh, when is a cosmetic not a cosmetic here um, yes if a product is indicated or recommended as having a therapeutic or um, a prophylactic property in other words it prevents something happening then it is a medicinal product it is not a cosmetic so um, if it has metabolic action as I said it's not a cosmetic and if the site of, of, of effect is not the skin or the hair or the nails or the teeth or the mouth, then it's not a cosmetic. Um, and the other thing is um, if it's swallowed, if it's ingested, it's not a cosmetic. So as regards pregnant women, if, they, if, if, if it's absorbed through the skin, it's very unlikely to be in large enough doses to have a teratogenic effect on the fetus because there'd be, you know, the active ingredients by the time they get to the circulatory system are fairly small. It's only medicines that are applied topically that would, you know, would... Yeah, exactly, but if a, if a, if a, if a, if a cosmetic has a steroid in, it's, it won't be a cosmetic. I mean, that was, an, that was illegal, and that's why he went to prison. Sorry, I just, one more question, yeah. that's all right. I just want to ask, have you done any testing on hair dyes? Because I know somebody who was scared because she was pregnant, and she was told she shouldn't be dying her hair. Yeah, well, that's, that's often, that's, and I think that's more t to do with the... Uh, the um, uh, people, the companies who own the hair dye, protecting themselves. Um, what does happen is a lot of people are highly atopic to certain hair dyes, and I don't think it's the hair dye per se that will affect the fetus, but I, I might be wrong. It's more to do, they might go into anaphylaxis or shock, and then they'll need to have medication to prevent them dying, and that might affect the fetus. I mean, if you go to any good hairdresser, they always do a skin patch test if you they're using a dye on you for the first time. I don't think that, that much dye is, is no, you know, no, I think it's more to do with if she's a topic. No, no we've, never te we, 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 we've never tested hair dyes, no. no. You'd prob it would probably be a trichologist who'd have to do that, you know, with specialized, um, you know, we always get a dermatologist in if we, as a consultant when we're doing skin studies and we get a dental uh, surgeon in when we're doing uh, teeth studies, so toothpaste studies. So I'd say hair dye studies would probably be a dermatologist to look at the scalp and a trichologist to look at the hair. It's quite specialized. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very okay, much. No